won't exist tomorrow. So I'd like to encourage people to ask questions, bring up points as we go, but there, it's going to touch on some big questions. So if you, think, if you think your question is really going to open up an ungodly can of worms, save it to the end, we'll have half an hour to chat at the end. Uh, or um, if, you, if you start with a small, innocent enough question and it starts to spiral out of control, be prepared for me to shut you down and we'll move it to a discussion and open our mind up. Okay, so uh, extreme simulation scenarios, thinking about promise, risk, and plausibility of artificial intelligence and virtual reality. So this is generally what we're going to look at today. First I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, about the big picture. Transhumanism, how it relates to ideas about simulation and these different uh, speculative technologies. <coughs> then specifically, I'm going to pick on three examples of some of the more extreme um, applications that have been dreamt up. Okay, so that's whole brain simulation, which a lot of people know more commonly as uploading. Virtual autonomous zones, which is sort of an extreme potential outcome of virtual reality technologies, and utility fog, uh, which is an idea we'll get into a few details shortly. I'm going to have a brief chat about the historical precedent behind these ideas. Like These ideas didn't come out of a vacuum, it's not like someone was sat in their office in 1987 and suddenly had an idea that had zero precedent in history. I generally only go back to about the end of World War II. You know, it's so ideas that were coming out of the 50s and 60s, both in the arts and the sciences. Just to give a sense of um, the, the direction and the context that some of these thinkers are coming from and how that stuff implicitly, for, um, in, implicitly informs the way we think about these things. Then I'll talk about some of the criticisms of these various ideas, and the criticisms come in various forms and mixtures of these categories. There are technical arguments basically saying this technology could not work because, or might not work because, you know, we're not just talking about people with extreme positions, but just legitimate questions and points. Moral arguments, you know, maybe we could get this thing to work, but should we? Metaphysical arguments, you know, maybe people have got views or questions about the state of the universe that um, raise questions about whether or not we can or should be doing these things. And then there's a sort of special class of this stuff, which is, it's about forecasting in a sense. We're talking about convergence, chaos, unpredictability, which is to say, if you're looking at something other than just linear trends, if you're looking at tracking multiple technologies and seeing how, how they're going to look once they've converged and been implemented in a society that has lots of different people with lots of different views, some of whom have more uh, leverage in the halls of power than others. So that complicates matters, so we'll talk about that for a little bit. And then the, the point I'll be bringing everything to is to talk about um, how we assess these things. You know, these are speculative long-term technologies, so people tend to be kind of emotive and they muddy the waters when they're trying to break down whether or not these technologies might work, uh, whether they should work, what's the promise they hold, what's the risk they hold, and also there's normally an elephant in the room, which is to say people often have a lot of opinions, they might even explicitly uh, adhere to a belief system like a religion that is compatible or not with some of these ideas. And so quite often people will be having a discussion um, that's being informed by a lot of unspoken stuff, and I want to bring that into the way. At least raise the possibility that when you go away and have conversations about this stuff, you should be asking people to explicitly bring up what their baggage is. So you can really get to the guts of what, what are people's objections? What are, they, what are they about? How do they work? Okay, so, right, so just general, um, general point of view. Just got a few little web shots here of the kind of stuff that these days or in the past has passed for virtual reality. Okay, so we've got a bunch of Second Life, which at the moment is sort of, um, you know, obviously it's got its shortcomings, but it's about the most popular 3D modeling sort of user participative platform there is out there. We've got some good old fashioned, um, you know, the future that never happened, um, VPL type stuff. So that's um, virtual programming language, Jared Lanier, who, uh, so basically it was all, everyone was going to be wearing goggles and gloves by the, the late 90s. Um, and then there are projects that have, have developed off the back of that, but have never really gotten outside of uh, academic development labs. Like this is a cave, um, which is what they generally call this, is basically a room at Iowa State University um, where simulations are projected onto the walls. Um, and, you know, and it's, apart from the fact that the graphics are never as good and there's never anything like a story, these are essentially like video games that instead of being presented on your, on your display, they're being projected on the walls of a room. I've done a few um, experiments where you, you take part in these 
take part in these kind of simulations and then report on your immersion experience. You know, where did the immersion break down? How good was it? That kind of thing. And um, safe to say that the experience of being in these things is generally more primitive and less impressive than just having a game of Doom, um, which is a shame, but it just shows that, that, again, it's a future that didn't quite work out. Here's another one that's very much like the VPL type scenario, except um, persons in a chain that's on wheels, so there's this sort of uh, extra degrees of freedom in the movement. But the point, I, the point I wanted to sort of bring up here when we're thinking about simulation is that to start with transhumanism. Transhumanism is an idea that's some, simultaneously getting more popular, but more specific and more mechanical. So for a lot of people, transhumanism is about uh, projects like SENS, you know, quite specific um, biotechnology projects or they're about particular types of politics or whatever, but the kind of stuff that was getting people excited 20, 25 years ago, even, even 10, 15 years ago, were the more extreme scenarios. And these are things where, you know, you've got your Ray Kurzweil's who will say, okay, biology, thanks to uh, biotech and nanotechnology, after a certain point, biology becomes a thing of the past. Now, regardless of the hype or hope shortcomings of these kind of arguments, the whole point is that the more extreme transhumanist scenarios envisage a post-biological society where things are simulated. Now, things, you basically break reality down into two categories. There are the things happening inside your head that model the world outside, and then there's the world outside, the stuff that's being done. <coughs> and broadly speaking, you can map artificial intelligence and virtual reality onto those things. So virtual reality is a simulation of the, the world, and artificial intelligence is um, in this sort of hypothetical following, following, following these technologies in the future. Artificial intelligence is about modeling the modeler. Okay? Now, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the origins of AI and how that's not what AI was originally and all that kind of stuff at a certain point. But I guess the point I'd like to make, and also just if you'll indulge me for two minutes, just raise a very brief discussion is to say, if you can imagine a sort of a hypothetical omega transhumanism, this is you know, where transhumanism is, is going. Um, so imagine that transhumanism is maybe by another name, but it's still politically, socially relevant, and that the goals of biotech as we know them have been achieved, um, and nanotech up to a certain point also achieved. So really, simulation is the deal now. What's important is simulations of the human mind and simulations of the, the world that the human mind perceives. Do people, does anyone have a problem with that idea? That this is a hypothetical transhumanism where it's all become about simulation because other battles have been... Well, I mean, this is, this is actually, an, to me, this is quite a, a straightforward intuitive idea that this is where things are going. But, you know, getting involved with transhumanism mm -hmm. over any length of time, the one thing you'll learn is that there, there are as many different types of transhumanism as, as there are people who can talk about this. I think it's important to recognise that the simulation is not about retreating into a virtual world, but using the technologies to allow you to not depend on biological hardware in this world. Absolutely, absolutely. I am um, slightly more generally. Um, this can be a strength and a shortcoming. What I've tried to do in today's talk is try not to pin down on <coughs> particular interpretations of certain technologies. You know, people sometimes will have assumptions like that that will inform their, say, moral judgments about a technology. If people say, virtual reality is bad because it means rever um, sinking into a certain world and not thinking about the rules of the real world, the physical world, or other virtual worlds. Um, and the, the thing is, these are assumptions. A technology can pan out in a lot of different ways. Also, uh, we're thinking about regular ordinary meat humans don't actually have that broader channel to the real world. We have five senses and they aren't awfully accurate yep. and a not awfully smart brain. Uh, Which is also predisposed so, to sort of creating quite constrained models of things. Mm -hmm. You know, even once you have taken on all all the information that your senses are capable of handling and that your brain is capable of processing, your mind essentially narrows that down more and more and more and more and more until you essentially have a cartoon vision of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of, I mean, this is a whole can of worms, but in psychology, um, 
a large, a large trend in perceptual research is 